Tonight on The Roast, Bob Catter gets a new campaign video and the Queensland government wages a war on stationery. But first, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has officially launched his Australian political party at a library in Melbourne. He attended via Skype because, you know, that whole thing. Now Assange announced seven candidates, including himself, who will stand for Senate seats at the next election. But since he's still holed up in the embassy because, you know, that thing, if he actually wins a seat, he's going to have to get pretty creative. At the very least, he'll need someone to mind his seat for him, and the most likely candidate is this guy. I can't sit here. Little bastard. Now, the WikiLeaks candidates who must surely now be on some kind of government watch list include a lawyer and human rights activist, a disability advocate, and a researcher on law, international relations and history. In other words, people who actually seem qualified to govern. I know, it's a terrifying thought. The WikiLeaks party promises to run on a platform of transparency. So when a WikiLeaks politician says, my door is always open, that door had better damn well be open, even if it's a bathroom door. No, strike that, not the bathroom door, it's a terrible idea. And with Assange stuck in the Ecuadorian embassy, well, he'll be unable to attend any party meetings in person and, and he'd have no option but to attend via correspondence. He'd, he'd have to dictate his orders over the phone like a mysterious benefactor of a sassy team of private investigators. Good morning, angels. Good morning, Julian. Us angels? What? Oh, we're Sanjels. Oh, that's much better. Now, aside from the voters, this will also affect the political parties currently in power. And for more on that, let's turn to Clark Richards live from the parliamentary offices. Clark, how is everyone preparing for the potential arrival of these WikiLeaks candidates? With WikiLeaks in here, this place will have to be completely transparent. No more cheeky toilet smokos, no more sneaky Christmas party closet kisses, and we've already had to implement a strict 10 photocopies per day ration to avoid unnecessary document leaks. Hey, hey, Brian, that's seven copies. Don't think I'm not counting. Give me that. Who said you could print this in colour? WikiLeaks Policies Draft 1. Cancel extradition treaty with Sweden. Introduce National Ecuadorian Embassy Appreciation Day. Sweet baby Jesus. Oh, is it really that bad? I just don't know who to trust anymore, Tom. After this election, every private email could become an open letter. Hey, Brian, don't you close that toilet door. The WikiLeaks party will think we're hiding something. They probably already leaked this conversation online. Those whitehead bastards! They probably already leaked this conversation online. Those whitehead bastards! Three views, is that it? Oh, all right, thanks, Clark. Next up tonight, Bob Catter, the Australian politician who never realised no hat, no play, only applied to school kids, has released a new campaign video ahead of the federal election. And it... It's no ordinary campaign video. Instead of making his own one like some sort of politician, Catter asked members of the community to submit their own advertisements for his party, Catter's Australian Party. Now, the call for submissions came via a YouTube video, the highlight of which was this. Yeah. We're on a horse here, and you need to be on a horse if you want food in Australia. At this stage, I'd like to point out, we did not make that video up, and our editor, Neil, will testify to that. Neil, that's a real video, yeah? Mm. Thanks, Neil. Now that we've made that clear, let's move on to the winning crowdsourced campaign video. One created by North Queensland duo Margaret Bell and Caitlin Hassenkamp. The following campaign video is rated C for crowdsourced. The roast advises it may contain graphic line dancing, heavy rhyming and frequent use of Windows Movie Maker. It doesn't matter, Bob Catter, that you wear a big hat. In a land so full of sunshine, there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't matter, Bob Catter. There it is! Uh, the new ad for Catter's Australian Party. Not to be confused, of course, with Catter's Croatian Party. But it's easy to see why Margaret and Caitlin won the Your Catter campaign competition because they succeeded in capturing Bob Catter's policy platform, especially his renowned pro-child-on-horse policy. Rachel Corbett is our political correspondent and she is joining us from Bob Catter's electorate of Kennedy in far north Queensland. Rach, what's your opinion of this crowdsourced campaign video? I totally love it. Sure, the video is a bit hokey, a bit lame, a bit the widest and most 1950s depiction of Australia I've ever seen, but I think we should remember Tom, if candidates from other parties tried to crowdsource a campaign video, they wouldn't be quite so positive. Uh, is this thing on? <clears throat> Kevin Rudd's a dick. He stabbed Julia Gill on the back. Rudd's a dick. I'll turn this off. 
Yeah, that's a good point. And did you hear actually that WikiLeaks launched their campaign yesterday? Yeah, I did. And I can't think of two more contrasting visions for Australia to be launched at the same time than the Catter Australia Party and the WikiLeaks Party. So what do you mean? Well, even though they look like brothers who chose different life paths long ago and are no longer close because one is trapped in an embassy, their parties are almost diametrically opposed. One's city, one's country. One's for open government, one's for a closed economy. One's all technology, the other one's all hat. You can't hack a computer with a hat, Tom. And then, of course, there's the behaviour of the estranged brother candidates. Cowboy Catter shows us how horses are useful but often wild and uncontrollable. And Assange shows us how his limbs have the same problem. And then there's the crowdsource campaign videos. This one's Catter's. Bob Catter. And this one's Assange's. We are Legion. We know all your secrets. Catter's. But you're not posh nor RP. Assange's. We are watching everything you do. You cannot escape us. Vote one Assange. Blah, 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 blah. Ecuadorian embassy. And finally tonight, Queensland's government workers are set to experience some pretty serious cuts to their budget. Appearing before a budget estimates hearing yesterday, Public Works Minister Tim Mander noted the government spent about $11 billion just on goods and services last year. And he explained that part of the problem was this, a pen. Not this pen, this is my pen. But the government doesn't need my pen because they have 395 different types of pen available. And look, I'm all for choice because it means that everyone can find their perfect pen, the pen that defines them. And that's handy for boosting staff morale as well as other things. Stabbed in the neck with a blue pen. Who would do such a thing? Not me. I use a pencil. Well, don't look at me. I'm a Mont Blanc man. I use a quill. Oh, that's where I left my pen. God, it's always the last place you look. And yet, you can have too much of a good thing, and 395 different types of pen is a little too much. Which is why Mr Manda said they'd be reducing the number of options from 395 to just 10 types. And look, I'm all for government efficiency, but just 10 types of pen? How do you possibly narrow that down? See, I love my Artline 0.2, but only until the nib bends and breaks. So then I think maybe I'll go cost effective and buy one of those no frills packs of 10. But you know the first three won't work, the next two will snap, and after that, you'll just be tearing the paper trying to get the ink to flow. So then you go, all oh, faithful four in one. But who the f writes with green ink? And then I have this highlighter, but what am I, a uni student? And I have no idea what the hell this is, but I love it. So how is the government going to decide which 10 to go with. That's yeah. what I know is going to be like at the end. Gentlemen, please, I know we're having difficulty reaching an agreement on which 10 pens we'll choose, but I can't help feeling that the best solution is if we just roll out the standard click pen across the board. No way, if I hear you click that pen one more time. All right, what about Bic? Bic are a French company. We can't be seen to be taking jobs away from Australia. <sighs> is there a brand we can get that you can put in your pocket that won't leak? You could stop using f***ing quills. Now, what about purple pens? Purple? What are we, 13-year-old girls writing our diary? Besides, every form we the issue needs to be in black or blue ink. Do you want the computers to explode? Yeah. No, I haven't even thought about the computers. Yeah. computers. That purple pen thing is an old wives' tale. Could you process my passport application? Thanks. So for more on these changes, we'll cross now to our workplace relations expert, Nick Richardson. Nick. It's the beginning of the end, Tom. The end of what? The end of my God-given right as an employee to steal from the stationery cupboard in quantities that are in no way necessary or even remotely justifiable. I've never used a post-it note in my entire life, but does that mean I don't deserve a few dozen packets of the things littered throughout the drawers of my home and office? What if one day I want to write myself a reminder? A reminder for what? I got things. I also haven't used a pencil since I got my pen license in 1996, but that doesn't mean I won't need 97 paces and the little boxes of lead refills. They're adorable, Tom. You taking anything else? I think I want this guillotine. Why? I got things. Nick, this is stealing. Stealing? Tom, everyone knows the office stationery cupboard is like a hotel. They expect you to take the bed. All right, Nick, well, before we... Are you eating paper? Yes, Tom, because I can. Right. Ah! Oh, you all right? Staple. All right, thanks, Nick. Well, that's all we have tonight. Okay, okay, did anyone here use a purple pen to fill in a government form? Anyone? No? Good night.